In the early days of astronomy, people looked up at the sky and saw wandering stars they aptly named planets, Greek for wanderer. But as technology progressed, they realized they weren't just moving stars, but actual worlds like our own. Venus and Mars in particular captured the imagination of many who wondered if they might be home to life. Before our telescopes were powerful enough, some astronomers even thought they saw vast seas and canals on Mars. But of course we came to understand that these were just darker spots on the surface of a very cold and barren planet with a very thin atmosphere. But what if the opposite were true? What if Mars was actually a world that was capable of supporting oceans and life, just like Earth? In this video, we will explore the history of Mars, how it could have become a more habitable world, and how a still very alien, but much more Earth-like Mars would have impacted the course of astronomy, the space race, and beyond. As you may know, Earth has a strong magnetic field that protects its atmosphere from being stripped away by the solar wind. This magnetosphere is part of what makes Earth a habitable planet today. It's thought that Mars once had a magnetosphere and thicker atmosphere, but it lost its magnetosphere about 4 billion years ago, and its atmosphere a few hundred million years later. There are several theories as to why this happened, but newer studies suggest that the composition of Mars's interior may be responsible for the loss of its magnetosphere. The InSight mission revealed that Mars has a larger and less dense core than expected, suggesting that it might have a higher content of lighter elements like hydrogen. This could make it more difficult for the liquid iron and sulfur in Mars's interior to mix and create the churning motion necessary to generate a magnetosphere. Essentially, it could be causing the same phenomena that prevents oil and water from mixing well. In this scenario, I will assume this newer theory is correct, so all I change is this hydrogen constant. With a magnetosphere like Earth, Mars never becomes the dead planet it is today. Instead, it retains a thicker atmosphere and its oceans. In this alternate world where Mars became habitable, single-celled microbes such as bacteria form shortly after the planet's formation, just like here on Earth. But in our world here on Earth, it took billions of years for eukaryotic cells, the type that make up animals, plant, and fungi, to evolve. Similarly, it took even longer for multicellular life and larger non-microscopic animals to emerge. This indicates such life evolving is much rarer. With that in mind, in this scenario, eukaryotic cells and microscopic multicellular organisms arrive much later on Mars, either through panspermia or independent evolution. Eventually, larger organisms also evolve on the planet, similar to the plants, fungi, invertebrates, and vertebrates that emerged in the early history of life on Earth. By the present, life on Mars would be very similar to Earth during the late Devonian and Carboniferous, where animals had just recently colonized the land, although the climate would be colder and there would be less oxygen, resulting in very different evolutionary adaptations than we saw on Earth during that time. Life on Mars would probably look very alien, yet still somewhat recognizable. In this scenario, Mars would look roughly like this by the present. Relative to Earth, it would be a much colder and drier world, with smaller seas and less precipitation, resulting in vast cold deserts covering most of its surface. It would also have less favorable conditions at high altitudes, where there is very little air. The oceans near coastal regions would be teeming with life, and on land in the wetter equatorial regions along the coasts of the northern ocean and lakes, it would look something like this, very reminiscent of late Devonian or early Carboniferous Earth, although colder in general. The warmest regions on the equator would be more subtropical rather than tropical, and climates would quickly become temperate as you get a bit further north and south. Further inland, however, the landscape would be very barren and consist of vast temperate and cold deserts, similar to the Atacama Desert on Earth. At southern latitudes near the southern ice cap, Mars would be incredibly dry, cold, and lifeless, much like the dry valleys in Antarctica here on Earth. At higher altitudes in the highlands surrounding massive Martian volcanoes, Mars would have an environment barely seen on Earth, with little to no precipitation, very little air, and very cold temperatures. Mars also has much more extreme seasons than Earth. How close Earth is to the Sun barely affects our seasons, with the main determining factor being which hemisphere gets more sunlight due to the planet's tilt. How close Mars is to the Sun, however, varies by a whole 10%, and its furthest point from the Sun just so happens to line up with its southern winter, and its closest point with its southern summer. This makes the climate more stable in the north over the year, but in the south seasonal changes are drastic. The southern seas are quite habitable during the summer, but completely freeze over during the winter. Mars would be a very hostile planet, with complex life being limited to the oceans, lakes, and coastal lowlands. The presence of the ocean, plant life, a thicker atmosphere and ice would slightly change the color of Mars as seen from the naked eye here on Earth. This may or may not have changed the name of Mars in this alternate world, 
but for the purposes of this video, it is still given the name Mars. History would progress much the same up until telescopes advanced to the point where we actually start to notice more than the wandering stars we first thought planets were. By the mid-1600s, as telescopes were advancing, was when Mars started being less than just a dot in the sky. Astronomer Giovanni Battista Riccioli noticed Mars had darker patches, and Christian Huygens would be the first to draw a rough map of what he thought the surface of Mars might look like. In our world, these patches were simply regions with a different regolith that reflected less light. But in this scenario, Riccioli and Huygens would be credited with first discovering and sketching Mars's oceans. In our world, despite Mars not being a habitable world, astronomers throughout the 1800s kept sketching the darker features on Mars as seas. Speculation around life on Mars would continue into the early 1900s. But eventually, astronomers would discover yellow clouds and note that the weather seemed very clear on Mars theorizing it might be very different from Earth. In this scenario, however, they would get a very different picture. Astronomers would notice white clouds of water vapor, like here on Earth. Some of the darker spots would turn out to be actual seas, and they would notice faint green patches along the coastline of the Northern Ocean. By the 1940s, Mars would be considered a likely habitable planet with life, with the vast cold deserts covering most of the surface, and with the atmosphere, while not being inherently deadly, still being too thin to breathe with the amount of oxygen there. Probes sent in the 60s and 70s would confirm these theories, and the Viking landers in the late 70s could perhaps be the first to actually send back images of Martian life. This would change the space race drastically. Suddenly, it would no longer just be a competition of prestige, but a competition of who gets to settle humanity's new frontier. Due to the value of the moon in settling the solar system thanks to its lower gravity, I think the Apollo program would continue and mirror the goal of our modern Artemis program more, or the Apollo program in the show for all mankind. The Soviet Union at this point would be desperate. In our world, the Soviet Union actually didn't have one national space program, but various design bureaus that worked on missions independently. They were also suffering from a lack of a clear goal at this point, as the US had already beaten them to the moon. But with this not just being a battle for prestige, I imagine the Soviet Union would be willing to risk it all and spend drastically more on its space program, perhaps even reorganizing it and forming a more centralized national program, with the obvious goal being eventual settlement of Mars. As the N1 was failing in our world, the Soviet space program gave up on it and moved on to other projects, but with the motivation of an entirely new living world for mankind to settle, I think they would be willing to pump a lot more money into the N1. The Soviet Union in this world's early to mid 80s would land on the moon and start planning for a moon base and mission to Mars just like the US. But this would never come to be. The Soviet Union in the 80s was already struggling economically. A massive space program would only make this worse. The Soviet Union still collapses like in the real world. The United States, meanwhile, would no longer be in as much of a hurry, its main competitor now being a well-funded European space agency, which was still in its early years. The long-term plan would be to turn the American moon base into a mining and manufacturing facility for Mars transfer vehicles. But this plan and settlement of Mars in general would be decades off due to how many people and resources would have to be launched. Unknowns like how feasible farming Earth crops on Mars would be, and of course the difficult task of actually manufacturing and mining on the moon. Even so, the US would begin work on a 21-month return trip mission with only a handful of astronauts, as they did in real life. Only in this scenario, they would get the funding. Much like the real-world 1969 von Braun plan, the first mission to Mars would consist of a long nuclear-propelled transfer vehicle assembled in orbit and a separate lander, although obviously adapted to this different, more habitable Mars. The landing site would be in the stable equatorial region, a good distance away from the coast, surveyed by rovers years prior. The primary goal of the mission would obviously be preparing for future permanent settlements. This mission could be feasible by the late 80s or early 90s, although it would certainly be a difficult and dangerous trip, with not ideal shielding from potential solar storms and cosmic rays, limited rotational artificial gravity that would either have to be quite low, or slightly uncomfortable due to the limited size of the craft. It would be risky and expensive, but with the European Space Agency catching up and working on moon infrastructure as well, and China's Space Agency just getting started, the US would have every reason to begin its exploration of Mars before anyone else. While the nine-month trip would be very dangerous, as well as uncomfortable due to the cramped conditions, and just having to spend nine months with the same people, once on the surface of Mars, astronauts could go outside with only an oxygen mask. They would be spending their time studying the local fauna, looking for potentially dangerous microbes, as well as attempting to grow crops in the Martian soil. This would obviously be extremely exciting for people back home, and we would get fascinating video of Martian life, 
and from their studies we would gain a tremendous amount of knowledge. After three months on the surface, they would have yet another nine-month trip back to Earth. There would be a handful of missions in each of the Earth-Mars launch windows every other year after that, but no permanent settlement. By the late 2000s and early 2010s, I imagined the European Space Agency could be a very real contender. In real life, they focused mostly on robotic missions, but not so much on human spaceflight. In this scenario, however, ESA would be Europe's way to the new frontier. In the 90s and 2000s, as the US was landing astronauts on Mars, ESA would be setting up a moon base similar to the US's, and by 2015-ish, China would be focusing its effort on a moon base rather than the space station they built in the real world. Around the 2010s is also when new technologies would completely change the game. Reusable rockets like what SpaceX is working on would also be developed in this timeline as computers become powerful enough for the complex maneuvers. Perhaps this could even happen 5-10 to 10 years earlier. The American moon base would at this point also have been working on developing some limited moon mining and manufacturing capabilities, and other space agencies would quickly follow suit. The settlement of Mars would begin around our modern era. While the technology might have been getting there earlier, there would still have to be extensive testing of these systems, and missions with materials and resources for setting up a base would have to be sent in advance. The first settlements on Mars would be research stations with rotating crews still partially reliant on resupplies. Astronauts would also have to follow strict decontamination protocols as to avoid disturbing the local wildlife or catching some unknown disease. But as time progresses into the 2030s, 40s, and 50s, this would turn into permanent self-sufficient settlements where researchers bring their families, and as soon as normal people start to arrive, it's inevitable Mars is exposed to our microbes and us to theirs. This could cause outbreaks of diseases or even a mass extinction on Mars. But on the other hand, Martian life might be different enough that neither would be well-suited hosts for each other's microbes. In any case, genetic engineering and advancements in medicine could help counteract these threats. But the Martian environment would certainly be affected in some way by humanity, as ours was here on Earth. Although the upside is that there are no fossil fuels. Those were deposited during Earth's Carboniferous, but on Mars life recently just arrived on land, so there are no oil or coal reserves. With the dozens and later hundreds of settlements, some disasters are inevitable. Much like the early English settlements in America, many of which struggled and failed, so would some Martian settlements. If there's a fire and buildings are destroyed, settlers would be dead by the time their portable air filters run out. Even though this Mars has life, it is still a very hostile place, and making it a home for humanity would be a long, tedious process with many setbacks. As time passes, the moon would become Earth's gateway into the solar system. Reusable rockets increase the amount of payload we can send out into the solar system, but the moon is on a whole other level. Earth-launched rockets are only 1-4% payload, whereas a rocket launched from the moon could be up to 25% payload, wasting far less mass on just raw fuel. Only things launched from Earth would be people, plants, and fertilizer to low Earth orbit, where a transfer vehicle constructed on the moon would pick them up and bring them further. Lunar and later Mars manufacturing capabilities would change everything. As soon as we have infrastructure in space, suddenly space travel becomes much more trivial. There would be massive alternate space telescopes and missions beyond Mars. These are all events I think are likely to happen in the real world, but a habitable Mars would be just the motivation needed for it all to happen decades earlier. This alternate world would be quite a ways ahead technologically, as so much funding for space exploration leads to countless advances not only in spaceflight, but also here on Earth. The further into the future we look, the more unpredictable things become. This alternate world would more than likely mirror our real world a lot. I think we become a solar system civilization in both. But a habitable Mars does give us a second stable home, where survival is not nearly as reliant on our technology as on a space station or a moon habitat. As generations are born on Mars, Martians would become a bit taller and thinner than Earthlings. Not because of any kind of evolution, that takes hundreds of thousands of years, but simply by growing up in the lower gravity. Martians might even struggle if they want to visit Earth with their weaker bones and muscles. As genetic engineering advances, I imagine Martians would also consider genetically engineering themselves to take in oxygen more efficiently or needing less oxygen, so that they could breathe the Martian air directly without any kind of air filter. That would certainly be much less of a challenge than trying to actually terraform a whole planet. A century or two from now, Mars might be a thriving home to hundreds of millions. In conclusion, while a habitable Mars wouldn't change human history entirely, from the 1900s onwards, our space ambitions would be much grander, much earlier on. The space race would be about first reaching the new frontier, 
and colonizing Mars would be a reality much earlier, likely already today if all settlers needed to live there were simple oxygen masks. If anything, I think it puts into perspective how difficult a task settling our solar system will be. Future Mars colonists here in our world won't be able to go outside and enjoy the Martian breeze. They will be limited to partially underground habitats to protect them from radiation and the near-vacuum Martian environment. On the other hand, it's also a fun thought experiment into what could have happened had we spent more on space exploration. If the NASA budget wasn't drastically cut after the Apollo program, we could have stayed on the moon and went beyond before some of us were even born. But going forward, a new space race is brewing as several countries are entering the space age and China is catching up to the US in its capabilities. So even if space exploration dreams of the 60s and 70s didn't come to be, they still can in the coming decades and century, even without a habitable Mars. But that's about all for now. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications for more content like this in the future. Thank you to all my channel members, and a special thank you to my second tier member, Lada Hino. See you all next time.